Welcome to this ASGCT Lunch and Learn. My name is Denise Sabatino, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I am a member of the ASGCT Patient Outreach Committee, and we've assembled some research highlights from the ASGCT annual meeting that was held in Washington, D.C. in May. This 25th annual meeting was one of the largest gatherings in gene and cell therapy with over 7,600 attendees. There were over 30 oral abstract sessions, each with as many as six abstracts in each session. And today we're gonna highlight 13 different abstracts from five of these sessions. The goal of today's session is really to provide some updates on some of the latest research that is relevant to the patient and advocate community. Currently, there are at least 19 approved gene and cell therapies globally. Three of these use adeno-associated viral vectors for delivery. 17 RNA therapies are approved currently, and there are, the majority of approved therapies are, are 56, which are non-genetically modified cell therapies. Dr. Katherine High, who received the Jerry Mendel Award for Translational Research. Dr. High is a leader in the field of AV gene therapy and has worked to develop many um, gene therapy products, um, moving them from basic uh, studies into clinical um, studies. And she, in her presentation, she posed some of the challenges that remain for the field, including pre-existing antibodies to AV and the ability to redose patients, which is not, we are not capable of doing at this time. And these are important challenges that need to be overcome for the field. She also highlighted the challenges of moving forward with clinical studies and proposed that we need to find ways to improve yields and manufacturing and analytical assays to more consistently determine the outcomes in clinical studies. Dr. Francis Collins, who's the former director of the National Institutes of Health, received the Founders Award. He highlighted the successes over the past two decades while emphasizing the need for us to have new transformative approaches in order to treat more patients. He proposed that we uh, put forth efforts into gene editing to develop new therapies, to also improve conditioning regimens for ex vivo approaches so that they are safer. And he also talked about the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium that was organized by the NIH um, and is working together with multiple groups. And their aim is to develop platforms and standards that will speed the development and the delivery of customized gene therapies that could be used to treat millions of patients that have rare diseases. So today we're gonna to focus on several abstracts that cover these different areas. First, we'll talk about some AAV approaches for treating genetic disease, including Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Pompe disease, as well as mucopolysaccharidosis or MPS and hemophilia B. We're also gonna highlight some studies that uh, presented work and trying to understand uh, the immune response to viral vectors, specifically AV vectors. And we'll also talk about some gene therapies for blood disorders, including sickle cell disease and X-linked skin. And then we'll highlight an abstract that talks about a therapy for COVID-19 patients. Before we jump into the abstracts, I just wanted to remind all of you the difference between in vivo and ex vivo gene therapy. In vivo gene therapy uses or delivers DNA in a viral vector or in lipid nanoparticles. And this is usually delivered intravenously or directly injected into a tissue and a patient. In contrast, ex vivo gene therapy harvests stem cells from the peripheral blood and then transduces these cells in the laboratory with a viral vector. And then these modified cells are then um, transplanted back into the patient. So both of these types of therapies will be discussed in the abstracts today. So first I'll talk about several AV approaches 
for treating genetic disease. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a genetic disease that causes progressive muscle weakness and loss of muscle mass. This primarily affects boys who typically present with leg weakness as well as problems walking. The disease is ca caused by a defect in the gene that interferes with how muscle cells produce a protein called dystrophin. Dystrophin is needed in order to strengthen and protect our muscle fibers. So in this abstract entitled Phase Two Trial Evaluating Safety and Efficacy in Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy, a Phase Two trial was presented. One of the unique features of this study is that the vector design uses a muscle-specific promoter to direct expression of the gene in cardiac, skeletal, as well as diaphragm muscle. And it also utilizes a microdystrophin gene and the AV capsid that was used is also known to target muscle. This is a capsid called AVRH74. So this strategy was used to um, direct expression after intravenous delivery into muscle, um, muscle. The key findings in this study were, was that the AV microdystrophin treatment group was able to maintain stable muscle function compared to the untreated control group. It was well tolerated with no safety concerns. So this appears to be a very promising clin clinical data that would support um, gene therapy for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. In this study, the IGNITE DMD study um, uses a microdystrophin gene therapy approach for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In this study, which was a phase one, two study, they found that microdystrophin was still being made in these patients two years after treatment when they sampled uh, muscle tissue. So shown here in this figure is an image of muscle and the red here represents the gene that's being expressed, the microdystrophin. So this is in one of the patients. They found that the motor abilities and the quality of life were also maintained in these subjects two years after treatment. And, and in this study also, they used a viral capsid that targeted muscle cells um, more efficiently than other capsids. So in this study, early results of this synthetic microdystrophin gene support the safety and the confidence for this approach for this disease. This study uh, that was presented was entitled a collaborative analysis by clinical trial sponsors and academic experts of anti-transgene serious adverse events in studies of gene therapy for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. This was an important study because it actually brought together four companies that are, have uh, clinical studies for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And they aim to investigate the cause of some similar adverse events that were seen across these different gene therapy clinical trials for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy where these patients had muscle weakness and heart problems, typically occurring three to seven weeks after gene therapy. What they found was that all of these patients that were affected by the adverse events had genomic deletions in the end uh, of their gene, a very specific end of the uh, dystrophin gene. So it was thought that these serious adverse events were likely due to an immune response that was T cell mediated to the new dystrophin protein that was being made in these patients. So this suggests that perhaps clinical trials may exclude some of these at-risk genotypes to ensure participant safety. However, more research must be done to really understand the immune response and its effect on gene therapy efficacy. And certainly uh, this study represents a collaborative approach among multiple companies um, that are committed to developing these approaches and really serves as a great model um, for other companies to follow. Pompe disease is a person's lack of the digestive enzyme GAA and glycogen cannot be broken down in these patients. So glycogen is a complex sugar that allows us to store energy. So these patients have muscle weakness and dysfunction in many vital organs. Currently, enzyme replacement therapy is available for these patients, but this doesn't fully treat all parts of the disease. 
In these patients, they have a defect in their GAA gene, which provides the instructions for the cells to make this enzyme. And it causes glycogen buildup in lysozymes and it causes damage to their organs. So an AEVA approach has been developed for pump hay disease. This was a study, it was a phase one study of gene therapy for late onset pump hay disease, an initial 104 week experience. This was a phase one study. And the goal here was to help the liver uh, produce the GAA. Um, and then the GAA would be released into the circulation to reach other tissues. So the enzyme replacement therapy was continued for six months in these patients after gene therapy. But after six months, the enzyme replacement therapy was discontinued. And what they found was they still maintained GAA activity that was observed in their serum, in their blood, as well as in the muscle. And this was maintained for over a year. So one of the observations of the study was that while they did detect GAA activity, they believe that they may have to have higher levels of expression in order to correct the muscle and achieve uh, better muscle function. Uh, the the uh, gene therapy was well tolerated and there were not any safety concerns. So this demonstrates that this liver depot approach where the liver would make this protein and then release it into the circulation for treating pump hay disease may be an effective way at improving the disease. And it certainly supports more research on um, a dose response in this gene therapy approach. Mucopolysaccharidosis or MPS is a group of genetic disorders that affects the body's ability to break down and recycle sugar molecules called glycoaminoglycans or GAGs. This leads to a buildup and causes severe damage to the body, including heart disease, short stature. They, these patients have difficulty breathing and they have a loss of brain function. These patients have a defect in their gene that affects how their bodies produce the enzymes that then break down these GAGs. So the, an AV gene therapy approach is being developed for MPS type two. So this is an interim analysis of data from a first in human study. It was a phase one, two study. Again, a first in human study at multiple centers. It was a dose escalation trial. In this study, 13 patients were dosed with no serious adverse events. There was dose dependent reduction in cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers. And there was an improvement in neurodevelopment function and caregiver reported outcomes in the first few cohorts for up to two years after the gene therapy. There was evidence of enzyme expression and biomarker activity after um, AV administration. So this suggests that this RGX121 could be a promising gene therapy for the treatment of severe MPS type 2. Hemophilia is a genetic disease that prevents blood from clotting properly and leads to prolonged external or internal bleeding in the body. Hemophilia is caused by defects in genes uh, that are vital to creating clotting factors. So there is a study uh, that was presented on an AV delivery approach for hemophilia B. The title of this study was Stable Hemostatic Correction and Improved Hemophilia-Related Quality of Life, Final Analysis from the Pivotal Phase 3 HOPE-B Trial of Enteroctogene Desaparvic. This is a Phase 3 trial. The findings were that the, the therapy was well tolerated and reduced the bleeding up to 18 months after treatment. So shown in this figure from this presentation is that are the number of um, annual bleeds or the annual bleeding rate shown in blue before gene therapy. And then the shown in orange is the annual bleeding rate after gene therapy. So you can see a significant reduction in the frequency of bleeding episodes in these patients. It was also found that in this study that even patients with low levels of pre-existing neutralizing 
A, B antibodies still benefited from this therapy. So this represents the first hemophilia B gene therapy to reach phase three clinical studies. Several of the abstracts presented at this meeting focus on immune responses to AV vectors. All of us have pre-existing immunity to AV due to natural infections that we've had during our lifetime. This results in, in neutralizing antibodies to AV. And this can be problematic in the setting of gene therapy because these neutralizing antibodies can bind to the AV gene therapy and prevent the viral vector from entering the cells. The other issue that can happen is that we also have T cell responses to AV. And so the T cell can recognize the AV vector proteins as a foreign substance. So both of these types of responses can be problematic in the setting of gene therapy. So this abstract entitled Functional Assessment of T cell responses to AV8 empty capsids and healthy volunteers looked at about 100 healthy volunteers that were delivered empty AV8 capsids. So these are AV viral vectors that had no treatment genes within them. It was found that these capsids activated the immune system, the T cells, in these healthy volunteers. They also found that the participants had evidence of liver inflammation. We also call this transaminitis after dosing. Some of these observations have also been made in clinical studies. In this study, treatment with an immune modulator called mTOR at the time of AV deliver, delivery delayed, but it didn't completely blunt the AV8 specific T cell response. Overall, the transaminitis and T cell activation that was seen in patients dosed with AV gene therapy during clinical trials was similar to those observed in healthy volunteers. And elevation of transaminases is linked with the loss of therapeutic efficacy. So understanding this phenomenon more in more detail is important. Another study was called the Optic Study of Intravitreal Gene Therapy with ADVM22 for neovascular AMD, the role of neutralizing antibodies. So this was a phase one study in which the participants uh, were delivered um, an AV vector intravitreally into the eye. And it was found that participants with lower levels of AV antibodies had higher levels of VEGF expression or the transgene for up to 50 weeks while patients that had higher anti-AV antibodies had lower levels of expression. So this shows that even in the eye, which is thought to be immune privileged, you do see an impact of these AV neutralizing antibodies on gene therapy. The participants um, who received the highest dose of the AV were able to reduce their supplemental therapy. These results support that vectorized treatment with a VEGF is safe and can provide sustained expression and reduction of VEGF supplemental therapy. This was a study to evaluate total binding antibodies against AVRA74 in patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So intravenous administration of R874 efficiently targets skeletal and cardiac muscle. And in this study, 100 participants um, with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy were analyzed. They were between ages of four and 18 years. So in this study, they measured the types of antibodies that were present in these patients and how these different types of antibodies might impact the response to the treatment. They did find anti-AV antibodies specific to this AV capsid R874 in the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy population, but most patients, about 86% of the D DMD patients did not have these neutralizing antibodies and therefore would be candidates for gene therapy studies. Testing for anti-RH74 
antibodies may predict which individuals would be the best candidates for trials using this serotype. There are also, we are also going to highlight several abstracts on ex vivo gene therapy for blood diseases. Sickle cell disease is an inherited blood disorder that causes red blood cells to deform and become sickle or crescent shaped. And this shape makes them easy to break, which causes damage to the blood vessels. These patients have severe pain, infections, as well as organ damage. Sickle cell disease is caused by the inheritance of a faulty beta globin gene. This gene controls how these red blood cells are produced or how they produce hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is a protein that's really essential for helping red blood cells carry oxygen throughout our body. This study is entitled Genome Editing of Human Hematopoietic Stem Cells to induce fetal hemoglobin for autologous cellular therapy of sickle cell disease. This was a, a preclinical study. Cells from sickle cell disease patients, as well as a non-sickle cell disease donor, were edited in vitro, and then they were transplanted into a mouse model. In this study, they showed high and efficient editing of the cells from all of the donors, and when they transplanted these cells into the mouse model, they observed therapeutic levels of fetal hemoglobin. The red blood cells exhibited a threefold reduction in hypoxia-induced sickling. So this study showed um, that genome editing of stem cells um, can be a um, possible um, approach for treating sickle cell disease. This study will also help conduct preclinical characterization for um, potential genotoxicity from this approach. This study was uh, titled High Anticycling Potency of a Gamma Globin in the Phase 1-2 Momentum Study of ARU-1801 study in gene therapy and reduced intensity conditioning for sickle cell disease. This was a phase one, two study. They did not observe any serious adverse events in the patients. The safety uh, was consistent with reduced intensity conditioning. So this was important because um, this type of conditioning is thought to be safer. Importantly, uh, four out of these five patients had no hospitalizations after treatment. Also shown in this figure are the number of vasoocclusive events, VOEs, before gene therapy in four patients and then after gene therapy. And in some cases, some, several patients didn't have any of these vasoocclusive events. The hemoglobin F levels were stable for all of the patients. The, this hemoglobin F has anticycline potency. And so this could certainly be another option for therapies requiring um, myeloablative conditioning. So not just for sickle cell disease, but for other diseases that require um, intensity uh, or conditioning prior to um, treatment. X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency or X-linked SCID is a genetic disorder that impairs how the person's immune system can fight off infections. This only affects boys who present with recurrent lung and skin infections in infancy. The disease affects their ability to gain weight and grow. And at this point in time, bone marrow transplant is the only available treatment um, for these patients. Excellent skid is due to a faulty IL-2 RG gene which provides the instructions for the body to produce all the different parts of the immune system, the B cells and the T cells. And this is what, so this is what causes X-linked skin. This study was entitled Lentiviral Gene Therapy with Low Dose Busulfan for Infants with x skid results in the development of a normal and sustained immune system, interim results of an ongoing phase one, two clinical study. 
In this study, children developed a functional immune system and survived for more than two years when conditioned with busulfan. So this is a different type of conditioning regimen. The treatment was well tolerated and most adverse events were resolved. Stable expression of all the different immune cells was observed and no malignant transformation um, was found in any of the patients. The outcome was that this change, the functional immune system um, that was previously not seen in another trial using this ex vivo gene therapy approach uh, without busulfan conditioning. So this conditioning regimen uh, shows great promise. Finally, I'm going to highlight an abstract on cell therapy for COVID-19. The title of this abstract was Safety and Efficacy of SARS-CoV-2 Specific T-Cells as Adoptive Immunotherapy for High-Risk COVID-19 Patients, a Phase 1-2 Randomized Clinical Trial. So in this study, um, they would isolate COVID-19 specific T cells from a recovering COVID-19 patient. These T cells would uh, then uh, be given uh, to patients that were high risk COVID-19 patients. There were no infusion related adverse events. The participants treated with the donor T cells cleared the virus more quickly and produced more CD3 positive cells compared to standard care of care alone. The treatment resulted in a 51% lower risk of mortality. So this certainly shows that COVID-19 specific T cells from convalescent donors was safe and feasible. This therapeutic approach may soon be available right off the shelf for treating high risk COVID-19 patients. So as we look to the future, the future is very bright. The best opportunity we have is to learn um, how different product characteristics, characteristics may impact clinical outcomes. The field needs to improve how we can characterize AV vectors and methods for manufacturing. And we need to find ways to extend gene therapy and gene editing to those living with more complex acquired diseases and not just rare monogenic diseases. We wanna thank all of the families who have participated or are participating in clinical studies because without you, medical research and advances would not be possible. I wanna point out that the abstracts from the 25th annual meeting are available at the link shown below. Also, ASGCT has free patient-centered resources on their website. And the website is shown here, patienteducation.asgct.org. We would like to thank all of our abstract presenters and authors, which I, we have highlighted here for your reference. And lastly, I want to point out that this recorded session will be posted and we would appreciate your feedback. And certainly be sure to register for the July Lunch and Learn, which is going to be entitled Diving into Preclinical Studies. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this Lunch and Learn. Um, we would like to open this up to any questions you may have about the presentation today or any specific questions about some of the studies that we shared with you. You can post your questions in the Q&A. Any question would certainly be welcomed. We also 
want to point out that in the chat, we provided an email address where you can uh, reach out to our patient outreach manager at ASGCT to direct um, questions as well. But I'm happy to take some questions at this time, if you have any. We hope that the session today provided with you, you with a glimpse of um, a few of the abstracts uh, and were, that highlighted you know, some of the work ongoing at the meeting. But there's lots of exciting work ongoing, and we hope you'll continue to follow um, some of these studies um, as uh, more data emerges from them. We do have a question. Question is, thank you for the overview. I would be interested to know how much of the patient informed consent process came up at the conference and whether any initiatives are ongoing to improve this. So, um, so we didn't try to address that in this um, topic today, but I think that we'll make note of that for future reference. So I know that um, many of these topics um, are discuss were discussed at different um, points in the meeting, but I don't have any specific information to give you about that topic, but perhaps we can um, reach out to the patient outreach uh, manager and see if we can give any additional information about that. Thank you for your question. I'm sorry I didn't have more information for you. There's a question uh, that came through. Um, it says, thanks for a great overview and updates. This is not a specific question about a specific study, but I was wondering about the types of professionals who attend the conference who are in the organization and asked if there were any genetic counselors. I would say that, um, you know, the society is growing and is comprised of um, not only uh, researchers, clinicians, but now I think is being extended further out into not only regulatory people and, and others, um, including maybe genetic counselors and people that will be involved in helping patients to understand these therapies. So I think that, um, you know, the society certainly welcomes many more to, uh, professionals to participate um, in the programs that we have at ASGCT at the annual meeting. So if you are a genetic counselor, please consider uh, joining ASGCT. So I have a note here that there is going to be a lot of virtual CME programming for clinicians, including genetic counselors, coming out in the coming months. So this is something you could um, be looking out for. Here another question. Uh, 
Um, so here, there's a comment about pub a paper that was published last year on the issues that as it relates to gene therapy. Um, I would be keen to see this and the complexity uh, as it relates to irreversible therapies addressed by the ASGCT. I think this is an interesting point. Um, and I think that uh, I'll make note of your, and, and check out your paper for more information. Thank you. Do we have any additional comments or questions that I can answer for you today? So I wanna point out again, if you have more specific questions that maybe you weren't comfortable asking here um, or would just like further information, you can contact the patient outreach manager at HGCT. Um, her email address is provided here so we can follow up with you um, to ensure your questions have been answered. Well, since I don't see any additional questions coming through, I wanna thank all of you for attending. I hope this was very informative. Um, and we hope to see you at the next Lunch and Learn. Thank you very much.